Tonight, eight teenage girls are accused of second-degree murder in a shocking attack in Toronto. I cannot remember the last time I've heard of an instance of this happening. What police say about the man who died and how the girls may have met. Trapped on the tarmac for hours as heavy snow buries Vancouver. So we've gone on the actual plane multiple times and then we've sat on the tarmac for maybe six to eight hours. From the airport to the roads, a colossal storm strands holiday travelers across the country. And will workers ever really return to the office? I think the days of coming in, sitting at your desk, going nine to five are over. How empty downtown cores are changing Canadian cities. This is The National with Anita Bath. Good evening. Adrian is away. We begin tonight in Toronto with a shocking crime, not just because a 59-year-old man is dead, but because eight teenage girls are now facing second-degree murder charges. All are too young to be identified. Police say the girls are from across the city. The two oldest are just 16, three of them are 14, and the other three are barely in their teens, just 13 years old. The deadly attack happened just steps away from one of Canada's busiest transit hubs. As Mike Crawley tells us, investigators believe the girls swarmed the man. One of the busiest intersections in downtown Toronto, only steps away from where a man was stabbed and died. Now police confirm eight girls are charged with second-degree murder. Three of them being 13, three of them being 14, and two of them being 16 years of age. Police say on Saturday night, the same group of girls was involved in a separate altercation and shortly after midnight, stabbed a 59-year-old man. He died in hospital. I wouldn't describe them as a gang at this point, but what they are alleged to have occurred that evening would be consistent with what we traditionally call a swarming. Investigators say there's no evidence the girls knew the victim and they're still trying to confirm how the teens knew each other. These eight individuals, from what we've gathered so far, is that they met each other through social media. They come from varying parts of the city. In the reaction to the allegations, one word keeps coming up. I was absolutely shocked. Never have heard of anything like this. Extremely shocking, especially when you consider the age of, um, of, the, of the people who, of the individuals who allegedly committed this heinous crime. I cannot remember the last time I've heard of an instance of this happening, especially not, uh, not in Toronto and especially not at the hands of young women. Police have not released the identity of the victim. They say he had recently been staying in Toronto's homeless shelter system. A resident of this shelter near where the stabbing occurred knew him as Kenny. My friend Kenny, he saw it. Stop them. Leave her alone. Assault and violence against homeless people is, is, is a daily occurrence, but that level of violence is something new and, and, and concerning. Now, Mike, we know the girls appeared in court on Sunday. Can you give us a sense of what could happen next? Well, all eight girls are remanded in custody, and their next court appearance is next Thursday, December 29th. I spoke with a criminal justice expert who said that a judge can order psychological assessments on any of the suspects, and given the alleged circumstances, she expects that that will happen with at least some of the girls. Thanks, Mike. A dumping of heavy snow in B.C. is throwing travel plans into chaos right across the country tonight. Hundreds of flights are grounded at Vancouver's airport with many people stranded trying to get home for the holidays and a whole system snarled. Roads have also been left a mess after 30 centimeters of snow fell overnight. People were told to stay home, but not everybody could. All of this couldn't happen at a worse time. Thursday is expected to be Vancouver International Airport's busiest day of the year. And as John Hernandez shows us tonight, YVR is full of frustrated travelers. At Vancouver International Airport, a travel nightmare. We got here and it was absolute chaos. The lineups were already so very long. Flight after flight cancelled. Some passengers stuck here for days. So we've gone on the actual plane multiple times and then we've sat on the tarmac for maybe six to eight hours and then redirected back to the gate and have to do it all over again the next day. 
It started with a blitz of cold and snow on Sunday, forcing widespread flight delays and cancellations. Then more snow on Monday night into Tuesday morning that grounded every plane here. You start off just accepting it and then you get more and more frustrated and then you get more and more tired. This couple from New Zealand was stuck on the tarmac for 13 hours with their one-year-old, watching as their supply of baby formula dwindled. We would have had enough for a, a bit of a like stoppage or delay, but for how long we were on there and how much we were having to give him to try to <laughs> keep him from screaming. Mm. Yeah, we ran through it quickly. At baggage claim, a sea of abandoned luggage. Others wait for suitcases that never come. Inside of my suitcase, personally, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are in the same boat. All my Christmas gifts, my family and everything, right? So it's a tragic to leave that. The situation made more dire by earlier snowstorms in central Canada, which had already backed up flights across the country. That basically meant that they, uh, many of these air, air, air Airlines had aircraft stuck in the wrong airports. And now there likely won't be enough seats to go around for the thousands stranded. It's going to make it extremely difficult and virtually impossible for people who have delayed or canceled flights at this point in time. The chances of them getting to their destination from Vancouver anywhere east is very slim. John, what are we hearing from the airport and airlines tonight? Yeah, patience is the key word. The airport called the number of cancellations today unprecedented, but did confirm that a small number of flights actually took to the air. Passengers are being advised to contact their airlines. Air Canada is telling people who have had their flights canceled to rebook online. And if you do plan on traveling in the days ahead, it's important to keep tabs on your flight because more delays and cancellations are expected in the days ahead. Anita. John Hernandez, thank you. Let's head now to Lindsay Duncombe in downtown Vancouver tonight. Lindsay, the airport's a mess, but so is much of southern BC. Yeah, there really are two realities in Vancouver, Anita. One is this unusual festive beauty, and then there's complete chaos. The scenery is breathtaking, as long as you aren't trying to get anywhere. I missed a Christmas a couple years ago, so I don't really want to miss another one. So I'm doing anything in my power to make sure I'm there. Tanner Hall is trying to get to BC's interior to spend Christmas with his three-year-old daughter. His flight was supposed to leave Sunday, but he got stuck on the tarmac twice. Blame the weather. I tried to rent a car, and then they told me it would be two days. My next flight would be to next uh, Friday. So I'm kind of dead in the water until Friday. Some journeys cannot be delayed. This outreach worker is making sure Claudia West gets to a clinic to take medicine that keeps her from using heroin. Really tough. You can barely get through. Yeah, thank God for some shovelers back yeah. there. Some parts are okay, but can't get through this. The snow makes the vulnerable more so. All night, Jory Rebin kept pushing snow off the tarp he sleeps under so it wouldn't collapse on top of him. So I had to constantly keep working, keep checking, and uh, make sure that I was prepared for anything that was about to happen. Probably didn't get much sleep. No. Drivers in the lower mainland, yes, even those insisting on a two-wheel commute, aren't used to these conditions. The wait for taxis, hours long, with dispatch triaging calls based on need. We're looking after the medical appointments, people that uh, has been went for doctors. Vancouver Island got even more snow. A lot of hassle, but this pretty. Not all British Columbians are rattled by extreme weather. In the north and the interior, this is winter as usual. That's where Tanner Hall is trying to go but more bad news. Uh, the text said the Coquihalla is closed. So what does that mean? So I don't, I don't think I'd be getting on this bus. Now the highway did reopen later, Anita, so he may indeed have made it home. And Lindsay, what are some of the concerns in the days ahead? Because I imagine it's going to be a mess for a while. 
Yeah, daycares were closed today, Anita, so parents are worried about what might happen tomorrow or in the days ahead. And then Canada Post has suspended service in Metro Vancouver, the Fraser Valley, as well as parts of the island. So that could mean Christmas presents might not make it on time. Lindsay Duncombe, thank you. CBC News senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff was out earlier just north of the city and explains just where all of this snow came from. Here in North Vancouver, we got about 25 to 30 fresh centimeters of snow last night. And that was the story across much of the south coast, waking up to 25 plus centimeters in downtown Victoria, 30 centimeters out towards Coquitlam. And this is our second snowfall of the week. So snow on the ground right now across parts of the south coast, 40 to 50 centimeters. That is not usual snow for the south coast. In fact, for Vancouver, this is our fifth snowiest winter ever since records began our single snowfall day. Uh, this is not the end of it either. Part of the reason why we saw so much snow last night is this Arctic air mass that moved in early in the week. Temperatures have been uh, close to minus 10 through the overnight across the south coast. So when a Pacific system moved in and hit that cold air, it was a recipe for this big snow. We also had convection leading to thunder snow and anytime we get sort of updrafts and thunderstorm clouds that leads to heavy snowfall rates which is why we ended up on the upper spectrum of the forecast great weather for uh, dogs and people alike who don't have to go out in it but we are looking at messy weather in the long range forecast another snowfall coming thursday night into friday that will start off as heavy snow transitioning to freezing rain and rain as we head into christmas eve so a lot of concerns about travel even as it turns to rain on christmas this day. It's likely, uh, in fact, uh, if not guaranteed, though, we've got a white Christmas on our hands. Johanna Wagstaff, CBC News, North Vancouver. Now to the investigation into a mass shooting at a condo building north of Toronto. We are learning more tonight about the five people who were killed. Thomas Daglin now with how they're being remembered. After the tragedy comes grief. With five neighbours killed at this suburban condo tower near Toronto, seemingly because of where they lived. Marilyn Iafrady came to honor her friend, Rita Camilleri. She was so good at what she did, and it was always putting the residents of her building first. At 57, Camilleri was the youngest among the five victims killed and now all identified by police. Her partner, Vittorio Panza, was the grandfather of Toronto Maple Leafs defenseman, Victor Mete. Our hearts go out to the victims' families. The team held a moment of silence before their game. Police say the attacks killed three of the condo's directors, leaving only two surviving board members, including Tony Catrone. It's just hard to hear the words that they were they were killed. You know, for for a, for a volunteer position, you know, trying to to make the the building a better place. An officer fatally shot the suspect, Francesco Villi, who held a long-standing grudge against the condo board. Investigators say he carried a handgun and opened fire in three separate units, also killing Naveed Dada, another board member described by family in Pakistan as a perfect gentleman. The chief of York Regional Police said this of victims Russell and Lorraine Manock. They were devoted to each other and their family. Soulmates in life and now in heaven. At 66, Doreen DeNino was the only victim to survive the attack. Our life has changed. We will never have any sense of normality. Where we go, where we walk, how we live, our home has been taken from us. His wife remains in this hospital in serious condition, while two ongoing investigations seek to answer key questions, like how the man police say was behind this mass shooting, got his gun, and what ultimately drove him to use it. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. At least two people are dead after an earthquake off the coast of Northern California. Well, I was lying in bed asleep like most people and it just kept shaking and shaking and things were crashing. The magnitude 6.4 quake hit about 350 kilometers north of San Francisco just after 2.30 in the morning. It damaged homes, cracked roads and left tens of thousands without power. Residents are being warned about the possibility of aftershocks. Tensions remain high tonight along the U.S.-Mexico border. A Trump-era immigration policy that turned away asylum seekers was supposed to expire tonight, but not anymore. Katie Simpson explains why and what it means for migrants desperate to cross the border. 
Shelters are well over capacity in some Mexican border communities, filled with migrants hunkering down as they wait for a major change to American immigration rules. There are many Venezuelans who need an opportunity, this man says. He plans to enter the U.S. once Title 42 is lifted. The Trump-era COVID rule that made it easier for border agents to expel asylum seekers was set to expire Wednesday. But the Supreme Court ordered a temporary policy extension while it considers legal arguments from Republican-led states on whether it should remain in place. I think most people here in South Texas agree that um, that enforcing Title 42, at least for, for, for the near future, is a good idea. In El Paso, some asylum seekers are sleeping on frigid streets. Shelters are already full. Hundreds of National Guard troops have been deployed in anticipation of a surge in crossings whenever the rule changes. We've heard that numbers are really big uh, in uh, Mexico right now in waters, and uh, there's probably over 20,000 over there today that are waiting for Title 42 to be lifted. The Biden administration wants the policy to end, but asked the court to give them until at least after Christmas to prepare. The, the direct, direct impact both on border management, but also on human beings has been really devastating. Advocates have lobbied the White House to kill the policy, saying quick expulsions endanger the lives of already vulnerable asylum seekers. Stories are, are really dire, and these are people who um, are just waiting to exercise their legal right to seek protection in, the, in our country. The Biden administration has promised to create a more humane immigration system, but it is woefully unprepared to deal with this immediate crisis that is poised to intensify. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And a developing story out of Washington tonight where a congressional committee has voted to publicly release Donald Trump's tax returns. Trump has fought for years to keep his returns confidential, but the U.S. Supreme Court recently cleared the way for them to be handed over to Congress. Today, the Democratic-controlled committee approved the release of six years of returns and the redacted copies are expected within days. Now, there are reports tonight Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will visit Washington tomorrow. That would be his first foreign trip since the war began. And as Breyer Stewart tells us, this comes after he made an important visit to a Ukrainian city on the front line. Ukraine's president frequently visits recaptured territory, but this was his boldest trip yet. The eastern city of Bakhmut is still besieged as Ukraine tries to stop a Russian advance. Little ground has been gained and losses on both sides enormous. I would like us to thank those who are not with us with the moment of silence, he said, as explosions boomed in the background. The city is now mostly hollowed out, except for a few determined residents. It's constant stress, this woman says. Bakhmut isn't widely seen as a strategic military target, but the Russian assault remains relentless. The city is in Donetsk, one of the areas Russia claims to have annexed. Several hundred kilometers from the front line, Russia's president met Kremlin-appointed leaders Tuesday. This after a seeming admission from Putin, who called the situation on the ground extremely difficult. In this pre-recorded message, he called on Russia's security services to step up surveillance. We must bear down hard and quickly identify traitors, spies and saboteurs. Some believe the message was an attempt to reassure those in the still-occupied territories that Russia will do more to protect them. Uh, most of the Russian public believes that Russian army appeared to be much more weak than we expect. On contrary, Ukrainian army much more strong than we expect. Ten months on, Russian forces near Bakhmut must feel that acutely, because after all this time, it's still very much under Ukraine's control. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. The situation for women in Afghanistan continues to deteriorate tonight. The Taliban has now suspended women from studying at universities. It's another very troubling, uh, troubling move. 
The move has drawn strong condemnation from the United Nations. The U.S. State Department says there will be significant consequences for the Taliban. Most secondary schools have already been closed to girls for more than a year. While Canada is facing its own health care crisis, in the U.K., thousands of nurses have walked off the job. Nursing staff have been underpaid and overworked for far too long, and we have had enough. How patients are being hit hard by historic labor unrest next. Driven from her country by war, one Ukrainian woman's agonizing choice. I was thinking about all of the people in Ukraine, about my husband. Her courageous return home. Plus, downtown cores transformed by the pandemic. Is it pre-pandemic? No. But is it getting better? Yes. How virtual work is changing cities and why some say they may never be the same again. We're back in two. There's concern in the UK as thousands of ambulance workers get ready to strike Wednesday. This comes after 10,000 nurses walked off the job again today for the second time in just a week. Katie Nicholson tells us why. Across the UK, thousands of nurses off the job. Nursing staff have been underpaid and overworked for far too long, and we have had enough. We cannot safely look after our patients. The second day of what is the largest strike to rock the National Health Service. Nurses are seeking a 5% pay raise above the 14% inflation rate. That would be 19%. The government has balked at that, but nurses say it's justified. The country, they say, is hemorrhaging nurses, lured away to places with better pay. Beds are closing already, staffing is short already. It's really hard to retain, it's really hard to recruit. 19,000 surgeries were cancelled Thursday, the first day the nurses walked. Patients continue to be impacted, but public support remains high. These people are fighting back for all of us. Sketch artist Inga Bystrom capturing it all. The young lady in the pink hat, mm -hmm. that's her there. She's sketched 60 protests so far. It's appalling what this government are doing. Across the UK, multiple sectors taking job action. Railway staff, postal workers, border agents. On Wednesday, thousands of paramedics will also strike, prompting the government to put soldiers on standby and ask people not to get injured. It is important that we, where people are planning any risky activity, I would strongly encourage them uh, not, to, uh, not to, to do so. The last time there was this much labour unrest in the UK was the late 70s, known as the winter of discontent. So far, no sign of movement from 10 Downing. A mistake, says this economist. You can stay firm with your position that we can't afford and this and that, but communication needs to be established. And unless it is, the UK can expect another winter of discontent. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, London. Now, health care funding in this country was one topic the Prime Minister and Quebec's Premier talked about today. <laughs> Francois Legault says he left that meeting more optimistic than he entered it. Premiers have been pressuring Ottawa to increase federal health care funding as hospitals across the country struggle to retain staff and deal with a surge in demand. Now, premiers have also been asking for Trudeau to meet with all of them together to talk about that funding. But in an interview with CBC News chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton, the prime minister says the government can't just put money into a broken system. I've talked to people on, on my program over the past few months who have come close to death on a number of occasions because they were waiting in an ER, because they hesitated to go to an ER because they were so sick. They see politicians fighting over health care and they feel like they are getting caught. And I wonder what you say to those people whose lives may be at risk because politicians, and I'm not, ju not just you obviously, yeah. but politicians can't get there, can't figure it out. If I were to send people all the money they need in the provinces, there is no guarantees that that those folks would be waiting uh, less time in the hospitals. But my responsibility is to ensure that all Canadians have access to health care. And quite frankly, one of the only levers I have is saying, I'm not giving you this money with no conditions. I'm giving it, uh, I, will, I will fully uh, participate in the funding of it, 
as long as those real improvements are made. You can watch more of what the Prime Minister had to say with Rosie Wednesday right here on The National. And the full interview with Justin Trudeau airs on Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television. That's noon in Newfoundland. As the war in Ukraine drags on, many Ukrainians are forced to face great risks if they want to stay in their homeland. I was afraid for any explosions, any, you know, anything that Russia can do. Coming up, we revisit the story of one woman who chose to return home after fleeing early in the war. For so many, the war in Ukraine presents an agonizing choice. Stay and risk death or seek safety in the West. Earlier this year, Susan Ormiston saw that firsthand when she met a woman named Olena, who fled with her young son and then made the tough decision to come home. Olena, this is when we first met. And Alex, you haven't seen this. We first met Olena Sobchenko in March during the early harrowing days of the war. Like so many others crowding the train platforms in Lviv, Ukraine, Olena was terrified of Russian rockets and the sudden shelling. In those panicked first days, she made the agonizing decision to flee, leaving her husband Alex behind. Was it difficult to make the decision to leave? It was very difficult to make the decision because I have my husband here. So I know that we're going to have a good future, but I have to be strong. Where is he? In Bielsarko, at home. The feelings are nearly as raw today. Her plan was to get to Poland with her 18-month-old son, Max, and then onward. Where are you trying to go? We are trying to go to Canada to our relatives because they are waiting for us there. She'd spent time in Canada as a teenager with her mom. But the separation from her husband and her home was hard. I'm sad and I'm angry. Immigration wasn't viable, it turned out, so four months later, Olena made another choice. To go back, to their home in Ukraine, to their life still at war. This is where you lived before as well? Yeah, 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 that's our place. It was a risk, but even harder was staying away. It was hard without husband, so I was thinking about all of the people in Ukraine about my husband, I really had some feelings of guiltiness. So like I felt guiltiness for being there and for being safe. You felt guilty? Yeah. Why? I don't know. It's, it's some kind of psychological, I guess, concern or issue. I really felt guilty for all of my people, which, you know, staying here and uh, which are suffering of all of this, uh, actually, you know, consequence. Life outside Ukraine with a baby in a refugee center took its toll, just living day to day. There wasn't no possibilities to stay in good conditions in Poland, actually. I couldn't pay for apartment. Uh, the price was a little high and kindergarten wasn't free. So I was thinking about coming home. And to be honest, we were coming back in, in, in fear, I guess. So that wasn't like, you know, okay, I go home and I feel okay. No, I felt really scary during our trip in the train. And why were you afraid on that train ride? I was afraid for any explosions, any, you know, anything that Russia can do. Mm -hmm. How did you get over that fear? Maybe praying. The war came close to their home, but now checkpoints are more relaxed, the trenches no longer needed, and nearby where rockets slammed into a residential neighborhood, reconstruction has started. And how is it now here? Do you feel safe? Ah, uh, how to say, maybe 50-50. But the air raid sirens are still frequent, and they worry. 
sometimes Max trying to even repeat the sound, like he, he's going like wolf, like ooh. So I'm saying to myself, okay, that he's not afraid, but he's trying to repeat the sound. Yeah, in the middle of the night, we're trying to check, is everything okay outside? Is it safe to sleep? Some of our regions, some of our towns are still under attack. People are still dying, so we are not 100% safe here. Olena feels safer, close to her husband, but confesses she still suffers from anxiety attacks. She's reluctant to go to a bomb shelter because being underground terrifies her. Making a living in this war economy is tough. Her English tutoring classes online pay barely enough to keep them in groceries. But she's learned something critical about her country and coping. I couldn't believe that the Ukrainian nation is so powerful and so strong. I couldn't believe that we can be so united together. So right now I'm really proud of Ukraine. I'm really proud of Ukrainian people that they are still fighting, that they are still you know, fighting to the end. And you accept that this will be a long war still? Mm, yeah, I accept it because what I can see, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy conflict. Last March, Elena was sure she had to escape with Max. In the volunteers' arms, they boarded the train heading to an uncertain future just like crowds of Ukrainian women and children. The future isn't any more fixed now, except that Olena is part of the pilgrimage back. Ukrainians who've returned, still on a war footing, but reunited. Alex, are you glad they made it back? <laughs> He's so happy. He was waiting for this day. He believes that we will meet each other. Susan, you've been in contact with Olena since you first brought us her story a few months ago. How is she? Well, very sadly, Olena and her son Max have fled Ukraine again to Poland after six Iranian-made drones fired by Russia exploded in her city very near her apartment building late this fall. She feels terrorized again, fearful for her son. Elena said she was torn about leaving a second time, but at the end of November, her husband packed them into the car, took them to the Kyiv train station and made a tearful farewell. He can't leave, so they'll likely spend Christmas apart. It's so tragic. As you saw in our report, she was so much more optimistic in early September and really beginning to heal from the trauma of the early months of this war. Yeah, absolutely heartbreaking. And Olena's story, of course, mirrors that of so many other Ukrainian families as this war drags on. Give us a sense of the wider situation for families forced to flee the fighting once again. Well, a lot of them are doing what Elena is doing right now in Ukraine. There had been tens of thousands of Ukrainians returning through the late summer and fall. But just on Monday, we saw drone attacks in Kyiv. And for months, people have been recommending that Ukrainians find shelter where they can, even outside the country, so they won't be worn down by darkness and cold with Russia attacking the energy grid. So it's a really seesaw feeling. Uh, over this holiday season in Ukraine. Susan, thank you. You're welcome. As Canadians feel the strain of health care wait times, one Canadian doctor is looking to ease some of that pressure. How can we essentially make this quicker, cheaper, faster, and better for patients? After the break, a plan that some say could be a model for the rest of the country. Plus... The pandemic has made downtown cores feel a little empty. Why some say it's a trend we should get used to.
As Canadian hospitals struggle under the weight of COVID, influenza, RSV and staff shortages, there is some hopeful news when it comes to some non-urgent surgeries. One Ontario doctor has tested his plan for streamlined surgery centres. As Christine Birak first showed us back in the fall, they're all about treating more patients in less time. The pandemic has added a whole new layer of patients into the healthcare system. To deal with the crush inside our hospitals, doctors say we need system level solutions. Inside this building in London, Ontario, is a model for speeding up general surgeries. And we're going to show you how it works. Can I get a 2 0 also? Proline, Proline please. This surgery will change Mary Curry's life. She's had foot pain for months. It's physically limiting and psychologically exhausting, but her pain is not life-threatening. Can you hold me a small uh, wire or two? If not for Abdel Rahman Lowendi, this procedure probably would have been pushed down a growing list of non-urgent surgeries. The average wait time in Canada last year was about 25 weeks. Curry waited roughly 14 for this moment. You're going to be able to walk on your heel today. It feels like you're inside a hospital, but it's not. This is an ambulatory surgical center. Ambulatory means the ability to walk. All patients, like Curry, who have surgery here, go home the same day. A little groggy, but pretty good. While there are similar clinics in Canada, London's Ambulatory Surgical Centre is part of the public health care system. It's backed by evidence and a well-known donor. There are two operating rooms here and staff perform between 10 and 15 surgeries a day, mostly orthopedic, but also some hernias, and they perform them at least 30% faster than in the hospital. This is a standard OR room here? So this here? is a standard operating room. Uh, it's a standard Dr. Lewendi is an orthopedic uh, surgeon. In 2016, so he started looking for ways to make the city's large hospital operating uh, rooms more efficient. So I kind of mapped out or modeled the OR in terms of its inputs, throughputs and outputs and thought, how can we essentially make this quicker, cheaper, faster and better for patients? Large hospital operating rooms must be prepped and ready for anything, whether it's a simple knee replacement or complex cancer surgery. It's all done in a critical care zone, which requires about six medical staff per operating room. And every surgery starts with a full range of sterilized medical tools, just in case. Surgery is very steeped in culture. Things are done a certain way because they're done a certain way. So if you were to model the operating room as a block, like this. Preliminary this findings room. from his research suggest yeah. things can be done differently. In a trial involving a thousand patients, surgery care costs in the conventional or large hospital operating rooms ran about $469 per patient. In the high efficiency or ambulatory center, it was $172. The cost difference in labor and materials is roughly 60%, as less complex surgeries often require fewer staff, less time, and smaller medical toolkits. By cutting all of that stuff out, you essentially can bring the cost, drive the cost down significantly, and then increase the efficiency, which in our system doesn't necessarily translate to saving more money. It translates to treating more patients. Research suggests patients treated in regulated ambulatory centers also have fewer post-surgery complications. Sounds like a win-win, but shifting culture is never easy. It was a bit frightening at first. <laughs> Jillian Holborough manages the operating rooms at the Ambulatory Surgical Centre and the larger ones in the nearby London Hospital. She's seen firsthand how streamlining surgeries made the hospital more efficient. Being able to take smaller procedures out of these big operating rooms just allows us to be able to uh, do more surgery. And patients like Ann Maddock reap the benefits. 
you know, you hear the horror stories of patients waiting months and months for simple procedures. So this, this is just incredible. So lucky to have it so close to the main hospital. She's waited about three months for her foot surgery. Within the hour, it'll be done. The Ontario government is looking at this public system model as a way to safely speed up surgeries. Based on the evidence, Dr. Lewendi and many other docs hope this will be the future of care for Canadians. I do think it's scalable, but I guess the will has to be to, to scale it. London Health Sciences has plans to scale up this ambulatory surgical centre from two to six operating rooms so more patients can have their surgery, go home and get on with their lives. Take care. Thank you. Christine Birak, CBC News, London, Ontario. The centre is on track to reach 5,000 surgeries by March of 2023 and that's going to mark the third anniversary of its opening. All right, we have more ahead on the national, including the future of downtown. Is it scary? Yes, it's definitely scary. How remote work is changing our cities and the businesses that's affecting, plus. Can you go get fleece? Can you, do you remember fleece? Oh, girl. How this chocolate lab is helping to raise month-old twins in our moment. In Buenos Aires today, millions of people filled the streets to celebrate Argentina's World Cup win as the team arrived home. But things quickly got out of hand. Players were paraded through the streets on an open top bus and two fans jumped on the bus from an overpass. One fell off head first into the crowd. Other fans climbed street signs and lamp posts. Players were eventually airlifted from the crowds by helicopter because of security concerns. Well, it's a good time to be looking for office space in Canada. The problem is few people actually are and office tower vacancies remain stubbornly high. As Peter Armstrong shows us, the real estate sector and businesses are trying to find ways to adapt. If you squint just right, it can almost seem like life at Union Station is getting back to something approximating normal. But it's not nearly enough for shopkeepers. Is it scary? Yes, it's definitely scary. Fatima Santos opened this shop just as COVID crashed into the economy. She's since reopened, but her business depends on commuters coming back into the downtown core. Is it pre-pandemic? No. But is it getting better? Yes. Her story is not unique. Vacancy rates in downtown cores across Canada are staggeringly high. Calgary's office vacancy rate today remains the highest. Vancouver's rate nearly tripled from pre-pandemic levels. Toronto has climbed about 10 percentage points. And Montreal's rate has almost doubled from the fourth quarter of 2019. I think the days of coming in, sitting at your desk, going nine to five are over. This expert says employees have more power in today's economy. With a very low unemployment rate, people had choices. So spaces like this aren't exactly sparking bidding wars. We're in the heart of the financial core in, in downtown Montreal, and it's an office space that's basically ready to go. This one has Luciano Delorio says employers need to think differently in this new environment. Having daycare facilities for children, having uh, gyms and showers. And as more of these corporate offices fill up, more commuters will return to places like Union Station. We hope so. We definitely have to just continue to re-evolve and uh, re-adapt to the climate. But the future of these office towers remains foggy, leaving thousands of retailers waiting for normal times that seem ever further away. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Dogs are often our best friends, but Lucy is much more than that. For month-old twins Lennon and Lily, she is the best big sister they could wish for. Not only has she been helping with diapers, baby bottles and more, she's been melting hearts on TikTok too. Her helpful big sister love is our moment. Lucy, can you tell Lily I love you? I love you. Everyone refers to her as a big sister and and she's uh, she's not our third daughter. She's our first daughter. 
when we brought the girls home, she was a little standoffish, um, but she quickly warmed up. And what started from me giving, you know, Lucy a, a bottle of milk and, and saying, Lucy, can you go bring that to mama? Lucy, can you go get the milk? She was really enjoying what she was doing. We we're giving her a job. Good girl. Now, can you go shut the door? Go shut the door. She can pretty much find anything. We're new parents. We have new parent jitters, so we would have her go get the thermometer for us. Oh, good girl. Diapers, that wipes. Wipes is important. We can really tell Lucy has um, a connection with the, with the girls already. We have them in the swing. She'll be sitting by the swing. We have them on their pillow. She's going to be by the pillow. People love Lucy so much. Um, they tell us how, you know, she she's changed their day. You know, we were having a bad day. We watched this video and, and she's an angel. And we here in Vancouver think today is cold. Well, Lucy was born in minus 38 degrees Celsius. She was the only pup to survive in her litter. She's been a fighter and protector since the beginning. And now she's so popular that people from around the world are saying that she brightens their day. That's the National for December 20th. Have a good night.